Good afternoon, everyone. We're live. Good afternoon, and welcome to this virtual meeting of the Health Policy Commission's Advisory Council. I'm Executive Director David Seltz, and first just want to say thank you to all of the Advisory Council members who are joined with us today on this Zoom meeting and YouTube channel, uh, and for all the members of the public who are watching this meeting. Uh, thank you for your engagement, and thank you um, for participating in these important conversations. Um, as always, the materials for the public meeting are available on our website, and there will be a recording of this public meeting available on our YouTube page uh, after the meeting con concludes. Um, so uh, advisory council members, uh, welcome it, welcome and happy 2022. This is our first meeting of 2022, and it's been a minute since we were all together. Um, so great to see all of you. Um, I think first just want to uh, note gratitude uh, for all that you have done and continue to do uh, as we continue to manage through this uh, pandemic. Uh, the last, since we've last met, we've had uh, the Delta surge, an Omicron surge that has really strained not only our healthcare system and the workers of our healthcare system, uh, but continue to strain all parts of, of society. And so I know that many of you um, and your organizations have been working extremely hard to make sure that Massachusetts um, comes out of this pandemic uh, stronger and continues to provide great high quality care to all the patients who need it, uh, COVID or otherwise. So thank you for all that you do, for your organizations do, and for the workers of your organizations. I'm hopeful uh, today we have a low hospitalization rate, low case count rates, low positivity rates, um, but concerns remain about the potential for future variants. Uh, nonetheless, this is uh, an opportunity to perhaps catch our breath for just a moment um, and reflect upon uh, the last two years and the impacts of the last two years. And that really is what the main topic that I hope to engage you all in with today, uh, specifically when it comes to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on our healthcare workforce. This uh, is an issue that I know is top of mind for so many across the Commonwealth, across this country. Uh, it feels uh, we, that we are at uh, a real moment of crisis. And so really today, I hope to uh, engage with you to get your perspectives, the perspectives of your organizations, the perspective of the people who work in your organizations or that you represent about the current challenges facing our healthcare workforce, but also to have a conversation about um, possible policy solutions or strategies that uh, Massachusetts should be considering and advocating um, to help strengthen our workforce for the challenges ahead. Uh, as you can see on this slide, this is the membership of the Advisory Council. It, this is an incredibly diverse group of healthcare leaders representing all different aspects of our healthcare sector and beyond. Um, and so I hope to really hear from as many of you as possible today about uh, the main question at hand of, of impact on the healthcare workforce. So before we dive into that main agenda topic, um, since it has been a little bit since we've, we've had the opportunity to gather together, I did want to provide some updates about the work of the HPC. And for that, I will turn it over to our Deputy Executive Director, Colleen Elsmeyer. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Director Seltz. I'm also very excited to get into our discussion topic today. But before we do that, uh, as David said, this is our first meeting of 2022. So we have to quickly show our annual HPC by the numbers slide, which is just a numerical illustration of the work uh, put out across the agency last year, across our four roles as researcher and reporter, partner, convener, and watchdog. And of course, our work with our advisory council members with you all was critical to any success uh, that we may have had last year. So of course, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, 2022 has been off to a very, very busy start. And on the next slide, you'll see uh, we are only three months into the year, but we've already issued six uh, brand new publications with many more on the way. Starting on the right side here, we have upcoming publications. 
We'll be issuing a report in the next couple of months focused on urgent care centers. This is a refresh of work we've done in the past few years. We also have reports upcoming due to the legislature on the healthcare workforce, on telemedicine utilization, and a study on the post COVID-19 healthcare system landscape. So watch for all of those. Those are all coming up very soon. Uh, and then on the left side, highlighting what we have released so far this year, I will not uh, walk through all of these, but we'll just highlight one item that you may have missed. This was released just yesterday. The first item, uh, we issued a new data points issue, which is our blog on the growth and out-of-pocket out of spending for uh, pregnancy, delivery, and postpartum care in Massachusetts. This report, if you missed it, is showing that out-of-pocket costs for pregnancy care, including delivery and postpartum care, are rising in Massachusetts, placing a harsher burden on families here. Uh, we looked at data from 2016 to 2018 and showed that out-of-pocket spending for birthing episodes and mass is actually growing faster than the total cost of care. So this is obviously a major affordability challenge because labor and delivery is the most common hospital admission uh, for Massachusetts residents under the age of 65. So we'll be continuing continuing to look at this. And very specifically, um, in that vein, on this last bu bullet, you will see that earlier this year, uh, we did release a new chart pack on certified nurse midwives and maternity care in Massachusetts. And obviously, to reiterate just what I said, maternity care is the top category for hospital admissions in Massachusetts. Um, and we found that in this report, as of 2017, most hospitals in the Commonwealth offering maternity care are also offering midwifery services, but we did find that there was substantial variation by hospital. So rates of midwifery care range from nearly zero to nearly 70%. Um, in 2017, 17% of Massachusetts births were attended by certified nurse midwives. So the full chart pack is available on our website. We've got an overview, a full overview of maternity care in Massachusetts, the whole landscape, the highlighting the variation in midwifery care, outcomes associated with midwives in the Commonwealth, barriers to practice of midwifery, and a number of policy recommendations in this area. But what I'm about to share with you, if, if you'll allow me today, is a video clip from a new HPC YouTube series, um, HPC Shorts, which highlights some elements of the re recent research and uh, publications that we want to share with folks in a, in a more visual way. So this episode pulls from the chart pack. Um, just a brief peek at this. If I know we all love watching videos in class when we were in school. So hopefully this is just a few minutes long. Um, if you could just allow me, if you could roll the clip. The Health Policy Commission explored the role of certified nurse midwives in attending births in Massachusetts hospitals. Midwives care for birthing people who have low and moderate risk pregnancies and deliveries and are the primary providers of pregnancy and birth care in most high-income countries. However, midwives are not as well integrated into the health care system in the United States. The U.S. has 15 providers of any kind per 1,000 births, only four of whom are midwives. Massachusetts has higher rates of midwife attended births than the U.S. as a whole, but lower rates of midwifery care than in high resource countries more generally. Certified nurse midwives are advanced practice nurses who provide care both independently from and collaboratively with physicians and attend births in birth centers and hospitals. As of 2018, there were 286 nurse midwives practicing in Massachusetts. Nurse midwives' role and presence varies from hospital to hospital. While over two thirds of maternity hospitals in Massachusetts reported midwife attended births in 2017, the amount of midwifery care provided at each hospital varies widely. In addition to the 14 hospitals without midwifery care, all the way on the left-hand side of the graph, rates of midwife attended births at Massachusetts hospitals range from 1% to nearly 70% over on the right-hand side. Midwifery care is associated with good birth outcomes and lower costs. In Massachusetts, hospitals with a higher proportion of midwife attended births have lower episiotomy rates. Hospitals with higher rates of midwifery care also see lower spending on the full scope of care from pregnancy through postpartum. 
our analysis finds that 10% more midwife attended births at only the hospitals already providing midwifery care could lead to 3,560 fewer cesarean births and 860 fewer episiotomies each year. Having a baby could cost $530 less. Policy changes that could help increase rates of midwifery care in Massachusetts include payment models for obstetric care that are neutral to provider type, hospital and payer policy changes allowing nurse midwives to practice more independently, and regulatory change to make it easier to open birth centers. Thank you so much. I did want to acknowledge uh, both the lead researcher and the voiceover artist on this, Dr. Sasha Albert. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, all right, with that, with that, sorry, I will turn it back to you, Director Seltz. Thank you, Colleen. And there are more of those animated HPC shorts on our website if you're interested in seeing those and um, would appreciate any feedback you have on our continued attempts to try to make this data more accessible um, in different formats for different audiences. Um, so please check that out. So I wanted to provide two other updates in this executive director's report of some big topics that the HPC is currently working on. So the first is our annual process for determining the healthcare cost growth benchmark. So we held our hearing on the modification of the benchmark uh, just a few weeks ago on Wednesday, March 16th. Um, if you were unable to attend or see that hearing, uh, the full recording is available on our website. I would highly recommend uh, at the very least checking out um, some of the research presentations. We had an incredible keynote um, from Dr. Aditi Sen. Uh, all of those materials are on our website. Uh, in addition to the recording, we also received written testimony from a number of organizations and individuals, and all of that also is on our website. So on the next slide, to just highlight that this is a uh, interesting and unique year uh, as we think about setting the benchmark. Uh, as every year, uh, setting the benchmark is a prospective effort. We set the benchmark for the next calendar year. And the purpose for this is to provide um, the healthcare system and the healthcare market uh, an understanding of what annual growth rate uh, they will be uh, evaluated against in the year to come. So we are setting this target for um, calendar year 2023. Uh, different than in past years, uh, there is broader discretion for the HPC board to set the benchmark at any number. However, the statute does say that the default rate uh, would be equal to our long-term economic growth rate or otherwise called potential growth state product, uh, which is set at 3.6%. So the default rate for this year, according to the law, is 3.6. However, the HPC board does have the authority to modify to any other number subject to a legislative review process. This slide just lays out the history of our performance against the benchmark and, and noting that um, we did also receive information about the performance against the benchmark in 2019 to 2020. 2020 being the first year of the COVID pandemic, and found that total healthcare expenditures actually decreased in that year by 2.4% due to reductions in utilization related to COVID-related um, uh, suspension of electives and other healthcare services. Um, so this is uh, obviously a very volatile time for healthcare spending. I think we all anticipate that the next year um, may see a large degree of growth um, as return, care returned um, and as pent up utilization uh, returned to the healthcare system. Um, but the question before the HPC is really to think about moving into the future. What do we think a sustainable rate uh, and an important rate of, for our target goal of healthcare expenditures should be moving forward? And again, just want to reiterate that the healthcare cost growth benchmark is not a price cap. It is not a rate cap. It is a statewide target for all total healthcare expenditures across all healthcare sectors and healthcare payers. So we're very excited to have the testimony that we received at the hearing 
the board is considering all of the information that was presented. And on the next slide, you can see that according to the statute, we do have a process by which uh, we will return to the board at April 13th to consider where to establish the uh, benchmark for calendar year 2023. If the HBC votes to modify, there is a continued legislative, uh, potential legislative process for review. So we are in the middle of this process. Um, thank you again to all who testified and participated. Um, and I look forward to reporting back at a future advisory council meeting uh, as to the establishment of the benchmark. The other big topical area that I wanted to highlight for the board is that the Health Policy Commission's board did vote at the end of January to require our first performance improvement plan from Mass General Brigham. Uh, as a reminder, the performance improvement plan is an important accountability process for the healthcare cost growth benchmark. Um, so after the uh, notice to require the performance improvement plan of MGB, uh, MGB has multiple options. Uh, MGB has filed for an extension to file their performance improvement plan. Uh, and that request for an extension will be considered by the board at its next board meeting again on April 13th. On the next slide, um, we just wanted to highlight uh, what the standards of approval for the actual plan. So once the plan is filed with the board, uh, the board will take that up uh, likely at the next regularly scheduled meeting, and we'll consider whether the plan uh, successfully addresses the underlying causes of the entity's cost growth, and will be likely successful in implementing the plan. Uh, on the bottom half of the slide, you can see additional factors that the board will consider um, in considering whether to approve the filed performance improvement plan. So uh, as said, we are in the middle of this process as well. Um, and look forward to uh, working uh, with um, uh, MGB to uh, file a performance improvement plan that meets these factors and standards for approval. Uh, so again, I will uh, look forward to updating the advisory council at a future meeting uh, as this process, a uh, very important process uh, continues. So those were really our updates on kind of the work of the HPC. Um, before we get into the main topical area for conversation, I want to just pause and see if there are any other questions that advisory council members may have about our recent publications, about the benchmark hearing process, about the performance improvement plan process, or anything else uh, that you know that we might be working on uh, before pivoting to healthcare workforce. David, I know uh, Colin Killick from the Disability Policy Consortium had a comment. Colin? Oh, thank you so much, Colleen. Uh, just a very quick announcement. I um, wanted to draw people's attention to an article in this morning's Washington Post. Um, I think we've all heard a great deal by this point about supply chain shortages and their impact throughout the economy. Um, for people with disabilities who rely on medical supplies, things like ventilator circuits, you know, tubing, sterile water, certain medications, uh, it's been really damaging, even life-threatening. So the article focuses on that. Uh, we were interviewed for the piece. It's focused around um, one of our board members, Crystal Evans. Um, so it's a fantastic read, a really important issue. We'd urge folks to check it out. I'm posting a link to it in the chat. And uh, Thanks so much. That's great, Colin. Thanks so much. And thanks for sharing that with us. I'll, I'll make sure to share that uh, with our team as well. Thank you. Any other comments or, or questions on uh, other work of the HPC? Well, great. Well, hearing none, and if there are some that come up along the way, always happy to take them, but really wanted to pivot now to the main topic for conversation among us today, which is the impact of COVID-19 on the healthcare workforce. And this is particularly relevant to the Health Policy Commission and our work because uh, the legislature uh, and the governor have asked us to study this. So as part of an act relative to immediate COVID-19 recovery needs, um, which allocated some ARPA funding, there was a provision included which directed the Health Policy Commission to study and issue a report on the state of the healthcare workforce in the Commonwealth. And you can see bulleted here, some of the particular um, subtopics that the legislative language 
directs us to look at, uh, including an assessment of, of shortages across a range of different healthcare sectors, an assessment of existing initiatives to develop cultural competency within healthcare professions, also an analysis of potential workforce development initiatives and incentive programs, um, and finally, an examination of current and potential role of, for community colleges to provide skills training and certification of certain healthcare professions. These were the ones that were articulated in the statute, um, although I would say that there may be additional topics that the Health Policy Commission may examine and report on as part of this work um, that are related to these main topics. Um, I want to introduce uh, one of our lead researchers, uh, uh, Sasha Albert. Um, who is helping to lead the, our work on this study. Um, and I particularly want to introduce her um, because we really plan to engage with a wide range of stakeholders, both in this meeting, but beyond this meeting, uh, understanding that there is, you know, so much activity in this space. Um, I think it's very important that we at the Health Policy Commission make sure that we're really contributing positively to the conversation and not duplicating the work of either other governmental agencies or non-governmental agencies. And so part of our plan for uh, beginning this report work is to do a little bit of a landscape view and to understand what else has already been done that we can pull from and learn from, and where are those gaps um, that would be most impactful for the HPC to uh, focus our attention on. Um, so before we get into the conversation, um, uh, Sasha Albert, I, I hope was wondering if maybe you could just uh, come off mute um, and introduce yourself and just say a little bit more about how we have begun to approach um, this report study. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, so as Director Seltz said, I am leading our, our work on this report to the legislature. Um, and with the knowledge that many groups are interested in and uh, working currently working on many challenges facing our healthcare workforce, um, we're, we're getting started by diving into some of the, the existing work that's underway in the Commonwealth, um, trying to understand the lay of the land and, you know, while being responsive to the legislature also trying to get a really good sense of where we can contribute from a from a policy perspective. So um, we've gotten started with you know just reading reading up the wealth of reporting and information that's come out in in recent months on this topic, and um, would welcome the advisory council's input on um, you know what we should be learning about and and who we should be um, speaking with as part of this effort. Thank you, Sasha. Um, and I think, you know, it probably goes without saying, but this has been an extremely uh, volatile time for our healthcare workforce with extreme uh, challenges. Um, some of these challenges, I think we should acknowledge predate, predate the pandemic, um, but were exacerbated by this uh, pandemic. And so when we think about uh, pre-pandemic shortages of essential workers, um, those have only been exacerbated by burnout, exhaustion, and other factors um, that have reduced our, our healthcare workforce uh, across a number of different skill levels and a number of different sectors. Um, so this is, um, I, I think, a really important inflection point and an important opportunity for us as a commonwealth to both identify some needed short-term policy solutions and strategies but also to think about this in a longer term strategy as well. Uh, I was particularly struck um, by a recent article I saw um, from the National Academy of State Health Policy, uh, which is a, a national non-for-profit that works with states across the country on health policy issues. And they recently highlighted that many states um, are, are really starting to focus on healthcare workforce and that for many governors in their state of the state uh, addresses highlighted healthcare workforce as a priority for them. And many states have in their budgets filed um, initiatives to try to increase uh, reimbursement, to provide greater training opportunities, retraining opportunities, retention opportunities. And so I think this is an area where, where um, we are not alone. Um, and all states are wrestling with this. But again, 
uh, we in Massachusetts um, have the opportunity with our, our uh, resources and expertise to try to uh, think both short-term and long-term about what needs, um, what our needs are, how best to fill them with an eye, of course, to our, our patients and the needs of our residents. Um, to just highlight one data set that really, I think, um, just is an example, an exemplar of the volatility that we've seen uh, in the pandemic. On this next slide, this is data um, from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics and uh, in Massachusetts. And I would note, um, before I ask our Director of Research, David Auerbach, to just walk through this slide, uh, that the data here is pre-Omicron. Uh, so this is uh, going through uh, only um, the second quarter of 2021. Um, and so I know that for many organizations, some of the more difficult staffing challenges uh, have actually been in the last six months. But even before that, um, we see incredible volatility. So um, Dr. David Auerbach, maybe can you just spend a minute just orienting people to this slide as, as just a, a framing for this conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as David said, this slide uh, is data that went through the through the end of June of 2021. And this is a great data source. Of course, there's no data source that's going to answer all the questions and issues we have on the workforce, but this data is updated fairly recently. And it's it's really showing um, some pretty you know flashing lights regarding workforce shortages. When you have the combination of a drop in employment, and a large rise in wages at the same time that is suggestive that that sector is, is struggling to find employees. And you see this especially in a few sectors. And so what this, what this is showing is that if you look, for example, at the home healthcare sector in the middle, that blue bar going down says that total employment in that sector in Massachusetts in 2021 was 15% lower than it was, oh, sorry, first in 2020 is the dark blue. It was 15% below what it was just a year earlier in 2019. And then if you go to the dark orange bar, by 2021, another year later, employment was still 10% below what it had been in 2019. So it recovered somewhat, but not all the way to the 2019 baseline. And at the same time, you can look at wages in that sector of all employees. And you see that wages in 2020 were 11.4% above what they had been a year earlier in 2019. And they rose another couple of percent in 2021 to be 14% uh, higher than two years earlier. And then if you look, for example, the, the last two sectors are especially um, dramatic in the sense, for example, of nursing care facilities, you can see that employment in 2021 dropped further from where it had been in 2020. So rather than recovering, it, it continued to, to, to drop. And the wages spiked 28% in 2020. And then by 2021, they had gone back down somewhat, but were still 16% higher than they were two years ago. So this is just, again, just one indicator of the, the degree of shortages that we're seeing in um, different sectors within Massachusetts. So before we move on to the discussion questions, I, I, I see a couple of hands raised. Uh, Colin? Firstly, thank you so much. This is a really useful chart to have, and I, I will send these slides around to some folks. Um, but wanted to point out first the obviously there's a connection between the home health care services and the nursing care piece in that those are substitute services right you know and certainly from our point of view in the disability community we tend to think you know more people should be shifting from nursing home care settings into the community for reasons of COVID safety as much as anything else but that can't happen if there aren't sufficient uh, home care and PCA um, availability um, the other point on that one possible at least solution, partial solution in that area to look into that we've brought up is in other states allow um, spouses to serve as paid caregivers to people with disabilities, spouses and children. Um, that's not currently allowed in Massachusetts because of the way that our um, state plan, um, state Medicaid plan is structured. Um, but that is something if the state were to pursue might help to alleviate at least a little of that pressure in the home health care services area. Thank you, Colin. And I, I think um, the, the first point you raised, I think, is really important because there are dynamics across these different sectors. Um, and as shortages occur in some sectors, some sectors may have 
more financial resources to be able to um, be able to hire, whereas other sectors may not have that ability. And so there are cross sector dynamics when there are significant shortages and everyone is competing for a smaller pool uh, of workers. Um, Dr. Auerbach, uh, we had a question in the chat about whether this data includes temporary workers. Do you know that off the top of your head? Um, yeah, it's a great question. It, it should. This is reported by the employers. It's an employer survey, but I can get back to you with a more definitive answer on that. Great. Thank you. Um, and again, you know, the, the role of, of, of traveling contracted workforce um, uh, is certainly a dynamic that we want to be able to understand as well, uh, particularly when we get a little bit more of the more recent data and thinking about the impact of Omicron uh, at the beginning of this calendar year. Um, and, and, and Steve, I'm happy to work with you and your team on that as well. So uh, with all of that as preamble, I'd love to just um, move into just a, a discussion um, with all of you. Uh, and so on the next slide, we've prepared a, a couple of discussion questions. Um, and I think, you know, I do want to spend some time talking about um, what you all would recommend in terms of, of policy options, solutions, and successful strategies. But before we get there, I do think it's important to take a few minutes, uh, take some time to reflect on uh, what are the current challenges that you or the organizations you represent uh, currently facing? Uh, it is really important for us uh, at the Health Policy Commission to get uh, real-time information about uh, the current challenges and, and your on-the-ground uh, perspectives are, are really helpful for that. So I know that we have a number of, of people here who represent healthcare uh, workers who represent organizations that employ healthcare workers. Um, so I'm just gonna open it up and I just would love to hear some reflections on, on, on really kind of what is the lay of the land right now? What are you feeling today, you know, March 30th, uh, 2022? And Tara, my friend, we'll start with you. Well, thank you, Director Seltz, for the opportunity and um, to Dr. Auerbach for um, sharing that data. And I think um, what we're feeling about our workforce is that the challenges and um, the lack of candidates is quite frankly, and the burnout that you mentioned, David, is existential for many LTSS um, provider groups. And I would classify the entire continuum um, for the reasons that you said we're competing for the same workers. And the slide that Dr. Auerbach shared that showed that wage growth was entirely fueled by the one-time revenues from the provider relief funds, as well as what the state allocated to nursing facilities. So as we're headed to the June 30th cliff, I am enormously concerned about what that means for um, further exacerbating workforce shortages. Right now, with an 80% occupancy, we are closing to admissions quite regularly. So that means many patients are backing up into um, Steve's hospitals. We're working really closely with Steve to make sure that we can find safe and, and suitable placements for patients who require skilled nursing facilities uh, care. But this is truly impacting access and quality of care. And so what we believe is really important is that we need to make permanent these wage investments and David, I really hope that as part of Sasha's work that we do um, look closely at the impact temporary nursing agencies have had on our workforce as well as continuity of care. Um, we should learn what it means, what our workers are telling us be, for their migration to temporary labor, but um, it does have ramifications because we're building in rates that aren't sustain uh, affordable, quite frankly, under our Medicaid and Medicare payments. So I'm um, very concerned about workforce, as you know. So thank you. Um, thank you, Tara. Existential crisis, I think, is a, a, a phrase that I think others would probably reflect here today. I, I wanted to just underline a point that you made um, that I think is very insightful as well. You know, I, I mentioned on the previous slide that there are kind of uh, cross-sector dynamics here in terms of organizations competing uh, from a, a, you know, a similar pool of workers um, and, and also national 
um, you know, staffing agencies competing for that same pool of workers. But I think you raise an important point about why this is so important for us to focus on is that these aren't just about, these have real patient impacts. Um, they have impacts on patients' ability to um, be able to be moved out of a hospital and into, uh, you know, a safe, high quality skilled nursing facility or back to home with home health assistance. And so um, this isn't just about kind of the organization's difficulty hiring. It's about how are we going to be able to um, be able to ensure that we're really providing excellent care. And I know organizations are incredibly committed to that and have been working so hard to ensure that. Um, but we need to think about what are the policies that are going to be able to make sure that that we can continue to make sure that care is um, appropriately um, being given at all the different um, levels of care. Um, Colleen, I th I th we have a number of hands raised. I I'm hoping you're keeping track. I think um, I Dr. Dunlap might be next, but Tell Dr. Dunlap is next, then JD, Lisa, Jake, and I think I saw Chris's hand, but you might have taken it down now. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, David, as you mentioned, this uh, uh, predated or antedated the current situation. I think as uh, organizations consolidated and got bigger, um, the healthcare workers were treated more like a commodity rather than like professionals, and their ability to interact and have an impact on policy and what happens in their institution became more limited. And so I think that even though you see rates going up because we have a national labor market, when you ask people you know, what would make them happy, it's not only more money, it's the circumstances under which they work and therefore the burnout and other issues. So we really have to sort of focus on what will keep people who are ready to leave in the market and what will help in recruiting. So there was a study that was released last week that showed globally healthcare workers want to quit and move. So this is not just a United States problem, this is a, a global problem. And as our population ages, it's going to become more acute. So I think that we really have to spend time talking to people in organizations, seeing what frustrates them. I know that I've watched the ability of medical staffs uh, be limited in terms of their ability to communicate that people during the pandemic, if you complained about uh, you know, uh, you know, protective gear, you got fired. I mean, so there's really a, a, a feeling that there's not a partnership with these larger organizations. And I think that's really a critical part of this. So it's not just money, it's really quality of life and pride and a lot of other things in terms of being treated with the respect that people think they've deserved. Uh, thank you, Dr. Donlab. I, I, that really resonates with me as well. Um, you know, what are the strategies beyond just wage increases to retain incredible staff and having that supportive uh, work environment? Um, and I think as part of our study, I think we do want to try to, um, I think it's important to bring the voice of the frontline workers into our study and to have them be able to in, in form our study about what those strategies would be and what dynamics and what do they want out of their healthcare workforce. And then to think about policies that could help organizations achieve that. And so um, today or in the future, if any organization has ideas about how we might be able to um, get more of that kind of frontline perspective on um, those dynamics, I think it would uh, really improve our, our study and our ability to positively contribute to this conversation. Before I turn to JD, I want to acknowledge um, one of our, our commissioners at the Health Policy Commission who has joined uh, the Zoom. Um, Tim Foley is our um, representative of the healthcare workforce on the HPC board and has been a long-term HPC board member. Uh, we invited him to um, attend and listen in and participate in today's advisory council meeting. Um, and so, Tim, you know, I will just wanted to turn over to you to see if you had any any quick remarks and please feel free to chime in at any point. Well, no, thank you, David, uh, for the invitation and uh, thanks for this important conversation. I think uh, I heard a little bit of the last 15 or so minutes and look forward to the discussion going forward. I particularly like the last comment about how to it's not just wages, although wages are important, but also how we're thinking about engaging the workforce uh, in a collaborative way. And I think one of the things that we strive to do is through labor management partnerships and engagement of the workforce um, and how uh, they are involved in day-to-day decision-making and empower them to feel more ownership of how care is delivered. And so we do a lot of that work. And I think that's one of the things that we should continue to talk about is the wages and benefits necessary to recruit and retain the workforce, which is critically important, but also 
uh, the respect and dignity and engagement of that workforce and the operations of health systems, I think is another important point that I picked up on right when I got on. So uh, appreciate the discussion and look forward to the study and the impact we can all have to address this critical issue, which I know uh, is important to everyone on the call. So appreciate the conversation and the opportunity. Thank you, Tim. Um, JD, you, your Mass Business Roundtable represents uh, healthcare organizations, but also a lot of non-healthcare organizations um, who also have been having extreme impacts of COVID-19 on their workforce. I'm, I'm interested in, in your perspectives and comments um, and reflections about what you're hearing from some of your members. Yeah, thanks, David. And it's funny, it's not inconsistent with what I've heard so far um, from the previous speakers. I, there are basically three things I'm hearing broadly. One is, like Tara said, the inability to find talent. Um, that is cross industry, it's statewide, it's every sector. Um, we're finding that for any size employer, and I'm sure John, John, can, uh, John Hurst can speak to that as well. The inability to find talent um, is a real competitive disadvantage right now. And we're hearing it from just about everybody. Second thing we're hearing about, Dr. Dunlap mentioned a little bit is that the concept of talent mobility, people are able to just kind of pick up and leave. Mm -hmm. um, we're hearing a lot of that now, particularly with the pandemic, that people are really rethinking those who can, um, how and where they're working. Um, and this notion of mobility um, is really changing the workforce dynamic in a lot of industries. And then the third one, I would say, is similar to something that Tim Foley just mentioned, which is the relationship between the employer and the employee is just fundamentally changing now. And um, the way employees are expecting their employers to provide supports for them looks a lot different than it did pre-pandemic. So for example, we're hearing a lot more um, from employees who are expecting employers to support their caregiving needs to support their mental health needs. Um, those are two that we're hearing quite a bit, um, as opposed to you know, providing the on-site fitness center or you know, a subsidized cafeteria, right? Like those things mm -hmm. don't have as much value as some of these other um, supports that employee, employees are looking for. And I think Tim's right, There's, there needs to be a partnership um, in how labor and management are going about this to make sure that um, employees are properly supported in the workplace. There's a there's a an example in the Senate um, the Senate mental health bill. There's a piece about you know requiring um, annual mental health visits, right? And that's something that employers can help offer in the workplace. I think it brings up a lot of issues about system capacity that we've been hearing about. So if you start you know making a list, David, of some yeah. policy recommendations, those are those are an area that we're starting to focus on. But I would say those three, the inability to find talent, talent mobility, and the changing nature of the relationship between the employer and the employer are the three that we're really hearing quite a bit about these days. That's really helpful, JD. And as, as you hear more about what organizations are doing to address you know, the, some of those concerns and what successful strategies might look like, we're, we're really interested in those two. I, yeah, I have right. also kind of heard and, and read a lot about employers um, you know, really being more cognizant of, of providing mental health supports to um, their workers and building that in as, a, as more of a priority. Um, and as, as you said, I think that's both a, a really positive change, but also um, we need that workforce uh, to be able to then be able to provide those services that patients need. Um, David, one real quick thing, which I'll yeah. send you, but care.com has done a really interesting report on the future of benefits which starts to get at a lot of this. Uh, it might be an interesting place for you to mine for some data. That'd be great, thank you. Um, so just going in the, the boxes here, Chris, Chris Carlozzi and then, and then Lisa. Thank you, David. And, and I would say from a small business perspective, I mean, we represent employers that usually have roughly 10 workers in all sorts of industries many of which were open during the pandemic for the most, for most of it. They are the types of businesses where they're going into homes, you know, electricians, plumbers, people doing service work, um, restaurants where you have workers coming in every day to a location and shops where people have to man registers. So those are the types of businesses we represent and they're facing similar challenges. They are seeing, we poll our members every month nationwide at NFIB, and we're finding about half of them still have 
um, labor shortage issues where they can't find people to fill positions. And when it comes to some of the skilled positions, the vast majority, it's roughly over 90% are struggling to find qualified workers. So that is something going on in the small business realm where there is still this major labor shortage. And we have to be very cautious when we're talking about raising wages and inflating wages in a lot of cases. Our, our members, we're finding roughly over 60% of them are paying more to their workers and have been doing that. But it is what's leading and, and driving up the cost of everything around us. And that can happen within the healthcare realm too. So we have to be very cautious when it comes to that. Um, be, because our businesses are struggling too. Our businesses um, are paying more and continue to do that when it comes to health insurance. So we just have to be very careful here because a lot of small businesses are facing the same challenges. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. And, and again, looking forward to you know, opportunities and, and lessons learned you know, across all of these, these sectors. Uh, Lisa, I saw, I saw your head nodding a few times when we were uh, talking, uh, introducing this topic. Um, would love to hear your perspective. Um, yeah. Yes. Hi. Thank you, David. Appreciate having the opportunity to speak. Can you hear? Yeah, you can. Yep. Great. You sound great. So, yeah, um, you know, I, coming from lots of different hats, did a lot with the home health direct care worker for a long time and now over in the human service. Um, case manager nursing side, I guess I'll start just by saying that one of the issues we're having um, with the human service side and the workforce with nurses and case managers is just the, the demand for remote opportunities. You know, we do a lot of in-person assessments. I know a lot of people on this call do in-person work, and we are finding it harder and harder to recruit people that want to do in-person work. And especially with people who are older, you know, tele, tele, telehealth is not always the best option. So, really trying to recruit people that are willing to do in-person work, I think has been a challenge for us um, on this side of the house. And it also relates to an issue that I don't think has been raised yet, but housing costs in Massachusetts. You know, I, I was at an event recently um, where, you know, this came up with the governor, I know speaks a lot about housing, but again, we're recruiting, you know, new grads, Kate, lo, licensed clinical social workers. They can't afford to live in the Mystic Valley area. So they want a remote job, they don't want to live here. So I think it all kind of ties together. Um, and then, you know, just generally, I wanted to say to Sasha, there's been a lot of work in the past research on home care and some of the ways to support home care workers. So I will definitely send you some information because I think we've done a lot of work in this space and thought a lot of thinking on how best to address the workforce crisis that we knew was happening in the home health spectrum. Um, and we haven't really gotten to the point of addressing those issues. So really excited about this work, but um, just wanted to raise the housing piece too, in addition to the remote work piece. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, the, the remote work piece and how that fits when uh, the need for in-person services, I think is a, a really interesting dynamic. Um, uh, Jake. Uh, thanks, David. And uh, yeah, thanks for the chance and, and the focus on this. Um, you know, I think from our perspective, I think we totally agree with the, the term that it's existential. Um, you know, I think nationwide we're seeing around 75 to 80 percent of home health agencies uh, denying referrals. And so I think looking at it any differently would be a, a disservice. Um, you know, I think that our staffing issues have been mounting for some time. Um, I think that the pandemic created sort of a perfect storm where um, we started to see that or, or see what percentage of our caregivers were, were caregivers in their personal lives. And so as we saw child care programs and schools shut down, um, we lost a, a large percentage of our workforce and trying to, to get them back has been a, has been a challenge. And then, um, you know, as, as we emerge out of the pandemic and into maybe an endemic phase, not to say that it's over, um, I think we're starting to see, as everyone is, these, these labor pressures. And, and given the way that home care and home health are reimbursed, it makes it difficult to um, compete and, and to retain our workforce by way of, uh, of wages, given the way that the reimbursement structure is set up. And so um, I think that aside from rates, um, you know, we look at, at it holistically. I think like everyone is saying, we're looking at it um, from a training perspective, from a, a student loan repayment perspective, but also quality of the job. What can we do to support the caregivers um, in their personal lives uh, with child care, transportation, and other things? I think that everything has to be on the table. Um, you know, 
as minimum wage has hiked up in Massachusetts, um, again, given the reimbursement structure and how we are reimbursed, um, it's been difficult uh, to keep up with that. Um, so there's a lot here, but uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Jake. Yeah, a lot here. And I think everything should be on the table as we think about uh, potential strategies and solutions and, and do want to carve out some dedicated time um, for that as well. Um, I'm going to turn now to, to Chris Schuster, um, uh, you know, a, a leader of an uh, independent community hospital that's been at the front lines of this pandemic um, and our first hospital voice here today. What, what's, what's going on? How are you doing? What, what is your experience uh, right now? And what are you, what are you feeling? Um, thanks, Dave. And hello, everyone. It's great to be back together again on Zoom. Um, you know, I think you have to look at this from a number of different perspectives. Um, the world really changed uh, through this pandemic. And um, even though it's ongoing, you know, I've, I've been able to separate out the non-clinical and the clinical position. So, you know, on the non-clinical side, there's much more options for workers than we ever had before. So you in the past would end up competing with other hospitals, other health centers. Now we're actually competing with Target and Walmart and um, all these non-healthcare entities um, that in some cases can offer better wages and benefits. And so that's been a challenge that we haven't really seen uh, prior to the pandemic. The other piece is the number of staff that I've lost because now remote options are available. And this sort of ties hand in hand with the lack of health of childcare. So I've had a number of people leave saying, I would love to stay here, but I can't find affordable childcare. So I'm gonna take an administrative assistant job where I can work from home and I'm there to get my children on and off the bus. So, you know, factors we haven't really had to deal with um, in the past, you know, on the clinical side, the early retirements um, have really hurt us, as well as those who have family members at home who may be immunocompromised and, um, or need care and can't find in-home caregivers uh, because there's a shortage in, in that area. And so have opted out of the system earlier. Why is this a problem? In a lot of hospitals, um, you rely on those seasoned nursing staff to train, bring along and mentor the new grads. And so we've definitely seen um, a loss and a lack of the more senior nurses that really bring along the, the next generation in the workforce. The, the other thing would be um, where more and more because of things like ASCs uh, and the larger academic centers coming out into the community uh, that the wage wars have begun. And so what makes it really difficult is that the wages are a moving target. And so it begins to be uh, out of range for some of the community hospitals to be able to pay what they may um, be able to make by working in an academic center who comes into a community and offers like an ASC type of service. So. Um, and can offer because of their scale uh, and scope um, some different benefit benefits. Um, so we've taken to try to be creative to retain staff by being as competitive as we can in the, in the market with wages and benefits, adding what folks uh, mentioned earlier, mental health options. So we definitely enhanced our mental health support uh, during our last round of benefit offerings. Um, but everything from training programs, make your own scholarships to return to school, um, continued growth and partnerships in every clinical area, RNs, LPNs, uh, CRNAs, um, anesthesiologists, uh, things of that nature. So that, you know, we're able to be a training site. Hopefully people come really love their experience in Emerson and opt to stay on. So um, I love to say there's probably no other time in my 22 years as a CEO that I've actually worried uh, about not finding enough staff to cover things. And wow. you're able to cover so long with travelers, but due to the expense, um, that you know, is not a good long-term uh, solution for us. 
So, you know, those are the things I just wanted to, to share today and I'm happy to be part of finding the solution. Uh, thank you, Chris. I mean, I think you very um, clearly articulated the, the dynamic nature of these challenges where, you know, shortages in, in home health care workers, um, uh, you know, impacts your ability to keep and retain someone who needs uh, care for a family member at home. Um, and so these things, um, you know, can, can impact each other. I think issues of, of child care, of remote work, um, how those have changed are, are common themes that I'm, that I'm picking up here. And, and what is the role of, of employers and organizations to solve these problems versus what is our role, you know, as a broader society to try to think of policy solutions to try to address uh, some of these challenges. Um, let me, can I ask a, just a quick return question to you? Um, for those people who, who have left, whether because of, of exhaustion or burnout or because of um, competing personal needs, do you think we can get them back? Do you think that there is an ability to bring them back into the healthcare system? And what, what would that take? I think in some, some cases there are, especially if they can find childcare, if they can find home care to, to help with a loved one um, who is at home. Um, but then I think when they decide, oh, well, maybe I'll return, then it's like, well, let me just see, can I find a Monday through Friday day shift job in an ambulatory surgical center that I don't have to take call? And, oh, you know, the academic-based ASC that's opening down the street pays $5 more than Emerson did, and even though I love the people there. And those, uh, because we all know that reimbursement isn't equitable, um, across the board and hospitals that don't have a very high Medicaid or disproportionate share of uh, Medicaid, Medicare payers, Emerson, Milford, Sturdy, think of those hospitals are at a very big disadvantage because we don't have the opportunity to make that up. And it's almost like you're penalized because of your zip code. And I can say that because Prior to this position, I ran a disproportionate chair hospital in Quincy and I ran a rural hospital in Athol. So I, I've been around the block with this and it just seems like we're gonna, the situation if not addressed on some level will further push consolidation, you know, at a time when I, I'm just not really sure that that's the best thing for the patients in our community. Uh, thanks, Chris. I think that's a really interesting dynamic of you know, potential um, workforce coming back, but not to the places where perhaps we need it the most, um, places that are, are truly treating, um, you know, complex patients in the community um, at a lower price point, organizations that don't have the significant financial resources of others. And so I think that's, that's really interesting. And also, I just would add, it may force places, and I can speak for myself, which you know, as a nurse, I believe in caring for the entire patient. So while hospitals around us have opted out of inpatient psychiatric units and outpatient mental health programs, we've continued to strengthen them uh, by adding telehealth um, in collaboration with, with Mass General. But we have an inpatient unit. We have multiple outpatient support programs. But I may have to look at closing those programs because they're break even or at a loss which we were always willing to do because it's so important. But if it comes down to survival, the, if you are a business person, those would be the first things that you would look to jettison. As a person who's a business person with a big heart, being a nurse and seeing the whole picture, I don't want to do that. And I really feel I don't want to be put in a position to have to do that because of, of rates. And so I think looking at this holistically is really, really important because I feel like the independent community hospitals are sort of getting lost in this whole pandemic mess. Thank you, Chris. Um, Michael Curry, um, interested in your thoughts and perspectives and um, to hear more about um, <laughs> the organizations you represent and how they have been uh, challenged by these dynamics and, and what strategies you've been thinking about. Yeah, I appreciate that, David. And of course, uh, taking notes and um, uh, echo much of what you've heard, the burnout, um, uh, the people who uh, are 
lifting up on this call, the challenges of, of salary and competition. Uh, it is not a secret. I think folks uh, on this call know the challenge that community health providers and community health centers in particular have faced uh, pre-COVID with recruiting, retaining workforce, particularly as folks um, could uh, leave the community health center space, the community health space, and uh, get salaries that are, are much higher at uh, higher paying institutions. So that uh, was exacerbated uh, by COVID-19. In fact, we were on a call with our CFOs just this week, uh, and many of them are reporting a, a 10 to 15% vacancy rate across clinical and non-clinical uh, uh, workforce. Um, that's devastating. Uh, when you think about it. So we talk about community health centers being on the front line of dealing with uh, chronic conditions with medically underserved areas. Add on top of that COVID-19, the testing, uh, at one point the contact tracing, now the vaccination, the, uh, the hesitancy that exists. And then on top of that, um, you're dealing with a shortage of staff, uh, being asked to really stand in the gap for the public health infrastructure that was so underfunded and under-resourced. So it's a perfect storm. Uh, even prior to the pandemic, we were talking about every health center on average had at least one clinical vacancy that could take up to a year to replace uh, because of that competition. I think we were looking at um, just the challenge of trying to meet this, this 50% um, uh, threshold uh, or, or market uh, compensation for some of our uh, clinical professionals was a challenge because they can leave and go somewhere else. It, the other piece that I think is important to reference here, because I don't know if I, I've heard it lifted up, is the diverse workforce. And the reality is we've not really invested in the way we should in creating that pipeline of diverse providers that we then started searching for in the midst of COVID-19, that we needed people who understood the lived experiences of those people in the community that could speak the many languages, um, that could uh, speak to people in their cultural experience and then respond with the care that was appropriate. We now realize after two years of the pandemic how critically important that is. Health centers have been on the front lines of that, but we've been challenged as well. We're losing some of that workforce. Um, it was lifted up early. I think it was uh, um, Ron, uh, maybe Ron or JD mentioned the, the, some of the issues. Uh, one of them I wanted to, to echo was this, the strategies on what works. Loan repayment works. You know, there's some short, short, short term and long term benefits to loan repayment, right? Sometimes we got to wait on the benefit. I would argue, and I don't know how often we lift this up from the community health center space, that when we invest in loan repayment and when we bring somebody on and get them in a rural area like Hilltown, Massachusetts, right? Incentive for them to go out and serve in some of our more rural sites or get them in a Mattapan or Roxbury where we need that capacity to serve those patients that are desperately in need of care. Um, oftentimes there's a, there's a rotation of these folks. They're moving into hospital systems. They're moving back into the community health center space. Um, so we're providing that opportunity. The, the league does a loan repayment program that has been super successful thanks to the state, uh, thanks to uh, Bank of America and others who've invested in that work. We need to continue to do it and we shouldn't be fighting for those funds every year. It should be baked into how we have a state strategy around uh, what I call, for those football fans on the call, the fourth quarter strategy, not just focused on the now, but how do you, how do you get to um, that workforce we'll need? Last but not least, which I think is critical to this conversation, I'll mention recently the Mass League was awarded a three-year cooperative agreement grant entitled uh, or titled Promoting Resilience and Mental Health Among Health Professional Workforce. Mm. Uh, the goal of that grant program is for healthcare organizations to adopt, promote, implement and demonstrate an organizational culture of wellness that includes resilience and mental health for the healthcare workforce. That's, uh, that's a huge benefit to Massachusetts. And of course, recognition to the health centers in Massachusetts to receive that grant. We're the only primary care association in the country to receive it. The Mass League in partnership with Mass General Hospital is designing an evidence-based uh, informed program to improve healthcare workers' resilience, wellness, and mental health which will be delivered to employees in five community health centers located in rural and medically underserved areas of Massachusetts. There's a lot more, David, that I could talk about. I'd love uh, to share that work with your team uh, and anyone else on the call that wants to know where that work is going, but credit to Mass General Hospital 
uh, for that work. So there's a huge challenge. I think just maybe one last point about where we're seeing the most vacancies, um, which I thought would be interesting for this call. Um, primary care, of course, uh, nurse practitioners, RNs, medical assistants, and physician assistants are the places we're struggling the most. Um, thank you, Michael. A lot of great points there. And I uh, want to thank you for raising uh, the importance of retaining and growing our diverse workforce with lived experience, a really important point that you raised. The league has been, you know, really just such an incredible leader in thinking about workforce challenges throughout the years. I mean, I will probably date myself, but I think I was an analyst at Ways and Means the first year uh, that um, we had that partnership with Bank of America for the loan forgiveness program. I'm glad to hear that that is still going. Um, but we are absolutely in touch with you. And I think your, your organization collects so much great information from the community health centers that I think will be an incredible resource for, for our work. So um, and, thank and you. And David, I, I was remiss in saying that you were a staffer in, in Senate President Murray's office and I was beating your door down. Uh, and you were a huge part of that loan repayment prog program. So thank you. I will give credit to Senator President Therese Murray on that one, but thank you. Um, Deb Wilson, would love to hear from another one of our, our community hospital, another independent community hospital uh, CEOs. How are you? Good, much better than January. And um, I just wanna say that obviously there isn't one thing that we should do to deal with the workforce crisis. There, are, We need to do it all. Um, I. You know, I echo some of Chris's comments and Michael's comments. Let's be very intentional about this. Um, I will look back at January and share with you that lack of bed capacity, zero bed capacity is not something that anybody in the Commonwealth wants to live with in the future. But the truth is today, I can't staff all my beds. Um, it impacts the people waiting in the emergency center. Um, the workforce is very, very tired. Um, and when you're resource constrained and you're in the news about your constraints, um, it doesn't make you the most competitive organization to recruit to. And uh, just like Chris said, if you can go to uh, an outpatient center and have no weekends and no nights versus working at a hospital, um, you know, oftentimes people will choose the better lifestyle. So I I do think that the Health Policy Commission should really help by looking at what the potential is for where the bed capacity issues will get worse because of the workforce challenges. And I do believe that unfortunately community hospitals will be less, you know, it's always less of a, um, there's less resources and I think we need to be intentional about supporting community hospitals and making sure that we help people to want to be um, employees of community hospitals and systems. So, but it's real and lack of bed capacity is a very ugly situation. Um, and I think we really should look long and hard about the um, pipeline and the supports for making sure that we remain competitive. Thank you, Deb. I'm, I'm glad to hear things are better than in January, but I, I suspect that there, it is still very challenging. Um, uh, David Mattiotto, um, you know, we showed some data earlier around um, uh, the impact on, on psychiatric uh, workforce. Uh, what, what are you hearing from, from your members? Yeah, actually, thank you, David. And it, this is good timing because um, the previous speaker, really nice segue to to, to what we're seeing. A few things without being redundant. We, we have tremendous workforce issues in the behavioral health uh, sector, um, but we're in a quandary because at the same time, we're seeing unprecedented demand. Um, we have on a given day in Massachusetts, about 600 people boarding in hospitals waiting for a, a behavioral health bed. I, I represent the inpatient psychiatric and substance abuse facilities and uh, do a lot of work with, with my colleagues at Mass Hospital Association. So they've been doing a survey every, every week that shows that data. Um, and we also did an analysis of what our staffing needs are and the gap, the delta between our license capacity and our 
uh, staffed, and it's about 600. We have just shy of 3,000 licensed beds in Massachusetts, and we're running census of about 2,350 kids, adults, geriatric. Meanwhile, we have 600 people waiting in emergency rooms, desperately trying to fill those to meet that need. The hospitals are desperately trying. Very similar issues to what you've heard before. Our biggest um, concern, our long-term concern is we're not seeing the applicants. Uh, we've done numerous employ uh, workforce fairs. Uh, the governor's office had one with the OHS in the, in the summer. We, we recruited all the hospitals to participate. We got very few applicants out of that. Uh, it's very, very challenging to attract uh, new people to this field. On a positive note, your last questions there, what can actions can policy make? We received a real lifeline from uh, the administration this year. They, they put $31 million into the inpatient behavioral health workforce funding, which kept us viable. Um, it's 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 prevented us from going way backwards, uh, and there's also some significant funding in the ARPA bill uh, to the tune of 400 million for behavioral health. 200 million of it is a little hung up now in the in the legislature. We're trying to get that loose. So a um, lot of same challenges, big barriers, not enough applicants. The biggest barrier we have is they, they want to make more money and uh, we're struggling to meet that. But uh, we're going to get through it and, uh, you know, and, and do the very best we can. So thank you. And um, I, we, we can share the survey we did with Mass Hospital Association that showed the workforce issues. We can share that with you folks as well. In your Thank you, David. Um, yeah, if you if you or anyone else has done survey work with your organizations or with your workforce that you'd be willing to share with us, we would absolutely appreciate that. Um, we know that a lot of that has gone on. And David, thank you for for mentioning um, the the significant and, and important investments that the administration has proposed and put on the table throughout this pandemic. Uh, for different sectors of the healthcare industry uh, to help weather the storm. I think it's a really important. Um, it, it was a tremendous lifeline for us and, and greatly appreciated. Um, I, we also showed some data at, at our benchmark hearing, uh, and this was just through, again, uh, the kind of the middle of 2021, uh, but we found that the rate of, of ED boarding continued to rise with approximately one third of patients who were admitted to the ED with a behavioral health reason ending up being there for more than 12 hours. So one in three. Um, uh, Donna, uh, let's continue to talk about um, these behavioral health and mental health needs. Yeah, thank you very much, David, and uh, everybody for your comments. I'd like to um, just build for a moment on the comments that um, uh, were earlier made. Um, and uh, recognizing um, both the, the work at, in David's organization and with the um, community health centers. Uh, there's also been a study done by the Association for Behavioral Health Care, which might be good for you to see. And if you've not seen it, I can send a copy where they have documented um, vacancy rates depending on the professional class versus frontline staff of 25 to close to 40% in some cases of vacancy rates. And that for every three uh, licensed clinicians they have lost during these last couple of years, they've only been able to recruit successfully to replace two of those. Um, you know, the underlying issue not to be uh, a broken record here is rates that have long been depressed in the behavioral health field. And I do want to credit the administration, the legislature for steps taken to increase rates in these last couple of years. But when you're starting with deficits of minimally 30 percent and going higher, depending on which license class of professionals you're talking about, um, that have persisted for a long time. It's very difficult to correct that 
even with a couple of 2% increases, and then the most recent one from the administration of a 10% increase uh, for salaries. But you, you still can't cover the full, whole gap that's there. And um, again, the steps that have been taken for loan repayment and for, uh, in some cases, for scholarships, both by the legislature and the administration are very important in contributing to developing the workforce and filling some of these gaps. But we've got quite a distance to go here. And um, as everyone else has uh, already said, a lot of competition uh, from a variety of sectors for what's a very valued and, and winnowing workforce in behavioral health. Thank you. We we have definitely seen that great uh, ABH survey that has been part of our, our research. And uh, for those that haven't seen it, uh, please go check it out. It is a, a sobering read, um, candidly, um, but highlights some of some of these challenges. Um, I you know I think as many have stated, there is not one silver bullet here. There is not one policy solution that is going to address these challenges. It's really going to take um, you know a, a comprehensive set of of strategies, short term and long term. Um, uh, in our, our last remaining time, I, I do want to um, bring a couple other voices to the table who've been uh, participating. Um, Dr. Strongwater, um, what do you see as maybe some of the things that we should keep on the menu uh, to help um, in terms of strategies to help here? You know, this is a very rich and powerful discussion. Just at the primary care level, um, we are short pipeline, uh, and that has to do with the rates. I think the governor's proposal uh, may help some there. I just put in a, into the chat, acknowledging the need for cross-state workers uh, by adopting uh, the cross-state compacts, which are helpful for nurses, for doctors, for nurse practitioners, in some cases for social workers. Um, I'm a, a, a big fan of supporting childcare options, uh, especially for entry-level workers. We, we need medical assistants there are, we, who might not sound like they're all that important, but they are critical in supporting primary care uh, and, and supporting patients um, more, more broadly. I, I love the discussion about the, the immigrant population. Uh, we have extraordinary opportunities to take advantage of people with great skills, and now might be that right time, um, uh, just a, as a consideration. And I'll just, my last point is, it's great to have loan forgiveness. I, I mean, I went to school that way, but there are people who may be challenged uh, to repay those loans and might otherwise be quite capable of taking on important jobs in healthcare. I, I just want to put in a plug for scholarships and grants for full funding for people with qu the qualifications. So I, I thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to comment. Um, thank you, Dr. Strongwater. Um, the, the issue of payment rates has been raised a few different times um, and, and the role of, of government, obviously, in the Medicaid program. I wonder if uh, Erica or Laura um, wants to comment at all about what the commercial health plans um, are doing or have done to help support uh, healthcare workforce initiatives, um, either through foundation work or through other types of grant programs. Um, interested in your perspective on the, how the commercial plans fit into this. Yeah, David, I, I can take that. I think that you know the plans have obviously made adjustments um, through the past couple of years around behavioral health rates. So I think that's one way we've tried to assist to ensure that um, we can attract more workers. Um, I would say the one thing that would be helpful, I think, is more transparency around labor costs. It's kind of a um, black box, and I think it would be helpful to everyone if we sort of understood that and understood how we compare to other states. And that might be helpful for providers as they try to um, put forward their case, but it's often not very clear or transparent to the health plans. Um, you know, I think that our foundations are doing um, a, a lot of work in this area, um, particularly in minority communities and trying to, um, you know, bring providers and to um, have some um, special rates where we can get um, providers into the homes and particularly during COVID with our um, members who were housebound. Um, but I would point out, I think someone raised in the chat, I joined a little bit late, I apologize, around immigration. I think... Um, some of the immigration issues that existed in the Trump administration have continued. There have been a lot of things coming at the Biden administration, um, but this really needs attention from our congressional delegation. I think it's hitting a lot of segments of the economy 
but I think certainly in healthcare um, as well, where we could um, hopefully attract workers, um, we're not able to get them into the states. Um, so that seems like an area we could all agree on and, and something we should work towards with our delegation. Um, Great, thanks. Thanks for chiming in, Laura. Um, uh, Dr. Dudlap? Uh, one thing I was concerned with, David, is that you know we talk about uh, capacity and, and volume of workers as if enough workers equals quality. But in fact, what we have now, because of the national labor market, we have a lot of bright young people coming out of more schools, more PA schools, more nurse practitioner schools. But what we've lost is the continuum of experienced people who can mentor them. So you find that you have uh, nurses with two, two and a half years experience, very bright, but they're missing that middle segment and upper mm -hmm. segment of experienced people that can really help them. I remember my first night on call, I hoped that I would be on with the most experienced nurses in history and the most experienced resident. Uh, and that's something that's really missing. Uh, that was a direct op uh, you know, observation in the top hospital in our city that the average nurse that I talked to has less than two and a half years experience. The PAs were the same and they were missing that the experienced person who could second guess them or really advise them. So that's something that you really have to look at very closely because the quality uh, is affected both by capacity alone, but, but this qualitative issue of the, the nature of the staff is really important. Yeah, the, the experience and the working together on, on a team. Um, uh, Erica? Thanks, David. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate some of the things uh, Laura mentioned. You know, I think we agree with a lot of the MAP plans, policies, but, um, you know, Blue Cross remains committed to looking for innovative ways to address some of these issues, especially in the behavioral health space. I think that is an area that we are still looking for opportunities and we will continue doing so. We're also really supportive of loan forgiveness programs. Um, and, you know, I do think Dr. Strongwater makes a good point about looking for things outside of loan forgiveness to help the pipeline and build it up. And so I think that that's something that's worth taking away from this conversation about maybe there are uh, places prior to loan forgiveness where we can entice uh, people into the pipeline more so than we're currently doing. And Blue Cross is committed to sort of continuing to look at all of those options. Thank you, Erica. Ron, go ahead. So one of the problems is that in looking for a more diverse workforce, the people that we're looking for have perhaps the greatest wealth gap and impediment to going into healthcare. So that's really something that if you can't deal with that, you really can't diversify your workforce. So that's something that we have to look at. I mean, we talk about black people, but you no, know, black is a diverse population of people now. Jamaicans, Haitians, you know, Cape Birds. So it's without having the cultural confidence to deal with that, um, you really can't get anywhere. So our vaccine problems and so forth, I think are directly traced to our inability to relate to the, pop the di various different populations in our state as it becomes more diverse. Uh, thank you, very well said. Um, we have a few minutes left. Um, wondering if there's anyone who hasn't had the opportunity to, to weigh in that would like to um, share some comments, feedback, um, perspectives. This has been an incredible, incredibly enriching and a sobering conversation at the same time. Um, but I feel like I, I've learned so much um, already and um, am really heartened by the, I think, collective understanding of the challenge that's ahead of us, even if we're still struggling a little bit with what are the solutions. Um, but interested if, if anyone else who hasn't yet um, spoken wants to say anything. Okay, well, hearing none, um, I wanna thank you for this uh, great conversation. Um, I, I, will, I will say with all humbleness, the Health Policy Commission is not going to solve this problem. Uh, this is a, a huge challenge. It is a global challenge. It is an ex existential crisis, as others have said. We want to be part of the solution and, and through our work here um, and beyond to really collaborate with uh, your organizations, the people you work with, and the frontline workers of Massachusetts so that we can um, build a, a stronger, more resilient, and more diverse workforce to meet the needs of our patients um, for the next, for the future. Um, so 
you will be hearing more from us uh, and Sasha as we continue this work. And again, um, really, if you have ideas, feedback, information, research, anything that you have on your plate that you want to send our way, um, we are um, extremely open to that at all times. Um, so thank you, uh, members of the Advisory Council, for a great meeting. Um, we will be meeting again uh, on June 22nd. So we will see you in uh, early summer. Uh, but until then, uh, please continue to stay in touch with us and we will with you as well. And thank you for everyone of viewing from the public. Uh, if you too have ideas uh, and suggestions on healthcare workforce issues related to our study, um, please feel free to reach out. Uh, so thanks everyone and have a great